Hello. This video is about surgical emergencies, and it is not intended to cover all details of this branch. It will cover the important points with some tips for the exam. According to the curriculum of the Royal College, surgical emergencies the topics that you see now. Note that some topics are already covered with other branches, so we will not talk about them here. Let's start talking about the important details of these topics and let's start with gallstone disease. Firstly, you should know the types of gallstones. Gallstones can be cholesterol stones, pigmented stones, or mixed stones. Cholesterol stones represent the most common type of stones, approximately 90% of stones. Pigmented stones are dark colored stones made up of lilirubin and calcium salts. Mixed stones are a combination of cholesterol and pigment stones. The main investigations that are used for the diagnosis of gallstones disease are abdominal ultrasound, magnetic resonance cholingiopan creatography, MRCP, and endoscopic ultrasound. Gallstones can cause some known complications. These complications are biliary colic, acute cholecystitis, acute pancreatitis, obstructive jaundice, and cholangitis. And you should know some details about each of these complications. The topic of obstructive jaundice is already covered under the gastroenterology and hepatology branch. Now we will mention some details about the other complications. Let's start with biliary colic. Biliary colic is the most common presentation of gallstone disease. Biliary colic is a steady non-paroxysmal biliary pain that occurs in the epigastrium or right upper quadrant and typically lasts for more than 30 minutes but less than 8 hours. It is not associated with fever or abdominal tenderness. Acute cholecystitis is the second most common presentation of gallstone disease. The clinical picture of acute cholecystitis is a sudden onset constant severe pain in the upper right quadrant lasting several hours. The pain is referred to the shoulder or the interscapular region. This is associated with fever. By examination, there is tenderness in the upper right quadrant of the abdomen with or without Murphy's sign. Murphy's sign means that inspiration is inhibited by pain on palpitation when the examiner's hand is positioned along the costal margin. So, acute cholecystitis is differentiated from biliary colic not only by the characteristics of the pain but also by the presence of fever, and Murphy's sign if present. If jaundice is added, then it is cholangitis. So, if there are fever, jaundice, and right upper quadrant abdominal pain, then it is cholangitis. And these three features of cholangitis are called Charcot's triad. So, Charcot's triad consists of fever, jaundice, and right upper quadrant abdominal pain. This means the diagnosis of cholangitis. For gallstone disease in general, treatment may include intravenous fluids, antibiotics, and analgesia. Then the patient is referred for surgical assessment for possible cholecystectomy. Now, let's move to the last complication of gallstone disease, which is acute pancreatitis. There are many causes of acute pancreatitis, but around three quarters of cases are caused by gallstones or alcohol misuse. And in order to easily remember the causes of acute pancreatitis, the first letters of the causes are collected to form the term, I get smashed. And the causes are, idiopathic, gallstones, ethanol, trauma, such as blunt abdominal trauma, or surgery near the pancreas, steroids, mumps, and other infections, malignancy, autoimmune diseases, scorpion stings or spider bites, hyperlipidemia, hypercalcemia, hyperparathyroidism, and other metabolic disorders, endoscopic procedures, such as ERCP, drugs, such as thiazide diuretics, azathioprine, tetracyclines, valproate, and estrogens. The clinical features of acute pancreatitis include Sudden onset severe upper abdominal pain radiating to the back. Nausea, anorexia and vomiting. Epigastric tenderness with associated rebound tenderness. Guarding and rigidity in peritonitis. Abdominal distension. Cullen's sign, which means a bluish discoloration around the umbilicus. Gray Turner's sign, which means a bluish discoloration around the flank. 
for investigations. The most important blood tests for acute pancreatitis are serum lipase or amylase. Serum lipase and amylase have similar sensitivity and specificity but lipase levels remain elevated for longer, so serum lipase is preferred. Also, CT should be requested where there is diagnostic doubt or in patients who fail to improve within 48 to 72 hours. Other investigations to look for the cause should be done. The treatment of acute pancreatitis is supportive. Medical management of mild acute pancreatitis is relatively straightforward. The patient is kept NPO, nothing by mouth, and intravenous fluid hydration is provided. Analgesics are administered for pain relief. Antibiotics are generally not indicated. The complications of acute pancreatitis can be local or systemic. Local complications include pancreatic necrosis plus or minus secondary bacterial infection, pseudocyst formation plus or minus infection, rupture, or hemorrhage, pancreatic abscess, pancreatic fistula, prehepatic portal hypertension, erosion of a pancreatic, splenic, or peripancreatic artery or vein with hemorrhage. Systemic complications include sepsis, acute respiratory distress syndrome, acute renal failure, multiple organ dysfunction, disseminated intravascular coagulation. Now, let's move to another topic, which is bowel obstruction. There are many causes of bowel obstruction, but the most common cause of small bowel obstruction is intra-abdominal adhesions from previous abdominal surgery. And the most common cause of large bowel obstruction is intestinal malignancy. Other causes include Crohn's disease, hernia with incarceration, appendicitis, intersusception, volvulus, foreign body ingestion, diverticular disease, radiation enteritis, gallstone ileus, pelvic mass. We will talk about some of these causes in some detail later on. The clinical features of bowel obstruction include intermittent colicky abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, constipation with failure to pass flatus or stool, abdominal distension, abdominal tenderness, tympanic abdomen, high-pitched tinkling bowel sounds or absent bowel sounds later, signs of peritonitis, and fever. For investigations, abdominal x-ray is usually diagnostic. Supine films are initially performed but if not diagnostic may be repeated erect to look for multiple fluid levels in the bowel loops. Abdominal x-ray features in large bowel obstruction include peripheral loops of dilated bowel, postra, which are thicker lines and lines do not cross the full width of the bowel, and dilation greater than 6 cm for colon, and greater than 9 cm for cecum. So, the large bowel, when obstructed, is peripheral, has hostra, and its diameter becomes greater than 6 cm. For small bowel, abdominal x-ray features include central dilated bowel loops, valvuli conniventes, which are lines that are visible across whole width of bowel, and dilation greater than 3 cm. So, the small bowel, when obstructed, is central, has valvuli conniventes, and its diameter becomes greater than 3 cm. If the X-ray is not diagnostic, CT is the gold standard investigation for diagnosing bowel obstruction because it has a greater sensitivity than X-ray, can visualize the level and severity of obstruction and is often able to identify the cause. For management, treat in the emergency department with fluid resuscitation, bowel decompression using a nasogastric tube, and analgesia. And refer urgently to surgery. The complications of bowel obstruction include intestinal perforation, intestinal ischemia plus or minus necrosis, peritonitis, sepsis, intra-abdominal abscess, fluid and electrolyte imbalance. Now, let's talk about some of the causes of bowel obstruction in some detail. And let's start with appendicitis. Appendicitis may be difficult to diagnose. So, you should know the clinical features of it as well as Alvarado score. We will talk about both of them. The clinical features of appendicitis include abdominal pain, fever, nausea and vomiting, constipation or diarrhea, 
tenderness over McBurney's point, Rothsing's sign, Soaz sign, and obturator sign. Abdominal pain of appendicitis starts as periumbilical or epigastric pain that migrates to the right lower quadrant over 24 to 48 hours. It is often worsened by movement. Periumbilical pain is visceral pain that is caused by stretching or irritation of the appendix. This pain is usually less severe, poorly localized, dull or aching in nature, and usually intermittent. The right lower quadrant pain is parietal pain which is caused by irritation of the parietal peritoneum. This pain is usually more severe, easily localized, sharp or stabbing in nature, and usually constant. Fever is often a low-grade fever that is associated with general malaise and anorexia. McBurney's point lies two-thirds of the way along a line drawn from the umbilicus to the anterior superior iliac spine. Rothsing's sign means that palpation of the left lower quadrant increases the pain felt in the right lower quadrant. So as sign means that passive extension of the right thigh with the person in the left lateral position elicits pain in the right lower quadrant. Obturator sign means that passive internal rotation of the flexed right thigh elicits pain in the right lower quadrant. Alvarado's score is a score that is used to assess the possibility of appendicitis. This score consists of elements from the person's history, the physical examination, and from laboratory tests, which are abdominal pain that migrates to the right iliac fossa, anorexia or ketones in the urine, nausea or vomiting, tenderness in the right iliac fossa, rebound tenderness, fever of 37.3 or more, leukocytosis, neutrophilia. The two most important factors, tenderness in the right lower quadrant and leukocytosis, are assigned two points, and the six other factors are assigned one point each, for a possible total score of ten points. A score of five or six is compatible with the diagnosis of acute appendicitis. A score of seven or eight indicates probable appendicitis, and a score of nine or ten indicates very probable acute appendicitis. Investigations are done to assess the possibility of appendicitis and to exclude other problem. This includes full blood count, C-reactive protein, urine dipstick test, and pregnancy test. For management, a non-operative management strategy with intravenous fluids and antibiotics can be a safe and effective approach in selected patients with uncomplicated acute appendicitis. But appendicectomy is the gold standard treatment for appendicitis. The complications of appendicitis include perforation, appendix mass, appendix abscess, generalized peritonitis, sepsis, intra-abdominal adhesions. Now, let's move to colonic volvulus. Colonic volvulus is an axial rotation of the colon on its mesenteric attachments. The sigmoid colon is the most frequently affected segment, followed by the cecum. Clinical features are those of bowel obstruction in general. For investigations, abdominal X-ray detects 75% of volvulus cases. Sigmoid volvulus appears as a characteristic coffee bean shape. Chical volvulus appears as dilated inverted U-shaped loop of colon projected towards the right side of the abdomen, which may appear as inverted coma shape. For management, for sigmoid volvulus, Flexible or rigid sigmoidoscopy with the insertion of a rectal tube may relieve the obstruction. The rectal tube is fixed and left in situ for 24 hours. For chical volvulus, laparotomy is the primary treatment. The complications of volvulus are those of bowel obstruction in general. Now, let's move to hernia. Hernia is a cause of bowel obstruction but hernia also has other complications. The other complications are incarceration and strangulation. Incarceration means that the hernia cannot be reduced. Strangulation means obstruction of blood supply of the herniated part. The types of hernia are epigastric, umbilical, inguinal, and femoral. Inguinal hernia can be direct or indirect. Indirect inguinal hernia is a hernia that is lateral to the inferior epigastric artery. Direct inguinal hernia is a hernia that is medial to the inferior epigastric artery. 
Indirect inguinal hernia is the hernia that usually extends into the scrotum. Direct inguinal hernia seldom extends into the scrotum unless very large and chronic. Inguinal hernia in general is bilateral in up to 20% of cases. Femoral hernia is more common in women than men. Larger femoral hernia may become visible as a lump or bulge in the area of the upper thigh, lateral and inferior to the pubic tubercle. The risk of strangulation is much greater than that of an inguinal hernia. For management, if there are features of strangulation or obstruction, admit immediately. Urgent surgical repair is indicated. For an infant or young boy with inguinal hernia, refer urgently to a pediatric surgeon. Inguinal hernia in infants requires urgent repair due to the high risk of obstruction and strangulation. Umbilical hernia in infants does not require urgent repair. Refer all others routinely for surgical repair. Now, let's move to intersusception. Intersusception is the telescoping of one portion of the intestine into the lumen of the intestine immediately distal to it. The mesentery is dragged alongside the proximal bowel wall into the distal lumen resulting in obstruction of venous return. Aleocolonic intersusception is the most common anatomical location for intersusception to occur, followed by aleoilial and colocolonic. Most intersusceptions are seen in children, usually infants under one year of age. Intersusception in older children and adults is rare. Boys are more commonly affected than girls. For clinical features, suspect intersusception in infants if there are paroxysms of colicky abdominal pain and crying during which the child becomes pale, distressed, and draws up the legs. And the child may appear well between paroxysms initially. There is also early bilious vomiting. And it is important to remember that the vomiting of intersusception is bilious. Breadcurrant jelly stools may be passed, which consist of mucus and blood. Abdominal examination may reveal a distended abdomen, a palpable sausage-shaped mass often in the right upper quadrant and absence of bowel in the right lower quadrant, which is called dance's sign. For investigations, abdominal x-ray may be normal, or may show the typical target sign. The target sign is a single hypoechoic ring with a hyperechoic center, indicating that one portion of the bowel has been drawn within the lumen of an adjacent portion. If the patient is clinically stable and perforation is not suspected, ultrasonography should be the initial diagnostic test for intersusception. Ultrasound has a reported diagnostic accuracy of up to 100%. The presence of a 3 to 5 cm mass just deep to the right-sided abdominal wall with the characteristic donut sonographical appearance is diagnostic of intersusception. For management. Stable patients should be treated with air or fluid enema. Surgical treatment is indicated for patients with suspected intersusception who are acutely ill or have evidence of perforation, peritonitis, or shock. Now, let's move to diverticular disease. Diverticular are sac-like protrusions of mucosa through the muscular wall of the colon. They are usually multiple, 5 to 10 millimeters in diameter and occur in the sigmoid colon in about 85% of people. The term diverticulosis means the presence of diverticular in the absence of symptoms. The term diverticular disease means symptomatic diverticular disease without inflammation and infection. The term diverticulitis means that the diverticular are inflamed and infected. Uncomplicated diverticulitis refers to localized diverticular inflammation that does not extend to the peritoneum. Complicated diverticulitis refers to diverticulitis associated with complications, such as abscess, peritonitis, fistula, obstruction, or perforation. The clinical features of diverticulitis include constant abdominal pain, usually severe and starting in the hypogastrium before localizing in the left lower quadrant, with fever, change in bowel habit, and possible significant rectal bleeding, possible nausea, vomiting, dysuria, and urinary frequency. For management of diverticulitis, uncomplicated diverticulitis is managed at home. Consider prescribing oral antibiotics if there is a suspected infection. Advise the use of analgesia, such as paracetamol is needed.
Advise the person to avoid non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and opioid analgesia, if possible, due to the potential increased risk of diverticular perforation. Complicated diverticulitis is managed at hospital. Intravenous antibiotics, fluid replacement, analgesia, and surgery may be needed. Now, let's move to ischemic bowel disease. The risk factors of ischemic bowel disease include old age, smoking, hypercoagulable states, atrial fibrillation, myocardial infarction, structural heart defects, history of vasculitis. The clinical features of ischemic bowel disease are relatively non specific. There may be abdominal pain, rectal bleeding, and diarrhea. CT is the current first line investigation of choice when acute ischemia is suspected and should be obtained early. For management, initial measures include supplemental oxygen via a mask, correction of hypotension with fluids and inotropic support if required, assigning nil by mouth status, inserting a nasogastric tube for decompression, and correction of any heart arrhythmias and metabolic abnormalities. Antibiotics suitable for enteric coverage should be given to all patients. Examples of the antibiotics that can be used are third-generation cephalosporin or quinolone plus metronidazole. The presence of infarction, perforation, or peritonitis warrants urgent exploratory laparotomy or laparoscopy. Now, let's move to hemorrhoid disease. Hemorrhoids are typically described as being present at the left lateral, right posterior, and right anterior positions, that is at 3, 7, and 11 o'clock. Hemorrhoids are classified as external or internal, depending on their origin in relation to the dentate line. External hemorrhoids originate below the dentate line and are covered by modified squamous epithelium, which is richly innervated with pain fibers. External hemorrhoids can therefore be itchy and painful. Internal hemorrhoids arise above the dentate line and are covered by columnar epithelium, which has no pain fibers. Internal hemorrhoids are therefore not sensitive to touch, temperature, or pain, unless they become strangulated. For clinical features, bright red, painless rectal bleeding is the most common symptom. Anal itching or irritation may occur. A feeling of rectal fullness, discomfort, or of incomplete evacuation on bowel movements may be present. For management, ensure stools are soft and easy to pass. Give lifestyle advice to aid healing of hemorrhoids. Manage any symptoms by simple analgesia and topical hemorrhoidal preparations. Non-surgical treatments include rubber band ligation, injection sclerotherapy, infrared coagulation, photocoagulation bipolar diathermy and direct current electrotherapy. Surgical treatments include hemorrhoidectomy or hemorrhoidal artery ligation. Now, let's move to anorectal abscess. There are many risk factors of anorectal abscess, but the most important risk factor is Crohn's disease. For patients with Crohn's disease, an anorectal abscess will develop in approximately one-third of patients. Patients with anorectal abscesses usually relate a history of localized anal or perianal pain. Pain usually begins one to two days before presentation and becomes progressively more severe. Fever is common and is usually less than 38.6. The goal of the treatment of anorectal abscesses is to achieve adequate drainage of the abscess without damaging the anal sphincters. Drainage of the abscess should be accomplished without undue delay because of the potential for the abscess to spread into a necrotizing, soft tissue infection leading to life-threatening sepsis. Antibiotics are not an alternative to surgical drainage, but broad-spectrum antibiotics with anaerobic and gram-negative coverage should be started preoperatively and be discontinued within 24 hours of surgery. Lastly, let's mention some causes of lower gastrointestinal bleed. The details of the important ones of those causes are covered in this video and other videos. Also, the causes of upper gastrointestinal bleed are covered in the gastroenterology and hepatology video. The common causes of lower gastrointestinal bleed include diverticular disease, colonic angiodysplasia, 
ischemic colitis, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, infectious colitis, colorectal cancer, internal hemorrhoids, anal fissure, colonic polyps. The uncommon causes of lower gastrointestinal bleed include Meckel's diverticulum, radiation induced telangiectasia, Dulafoy's lesion, aortoenteric fistula, vasculitis, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, blue rubber bleb nevis syndrome, anal or rectal cancer, rectal varices, post polypectomy bleeding, non steroidal anti inflammatory drug colopathy, upper GI bleeding prostate biopsy site bleeding, endometriosis.